Hello, and welcome to Replay Value. I don't watch Game of Thrones, so I had the outside perspective of watching the internet at large meltdown with every new episode in the final season, as it slowly but surely proved that it had no idea how to end in a satisfying manner. It's intrinsically disappointing to be let down when everything pointed to a solid story and it just wasn't able to stick the landing in any way, shape, or form. Forgetting plot points, extinguishing character arcs, maybe even a collapse of the structure itself. It's tough to be burned, but even while I avoided the collapse of Game of Thrones and couldn't have cared less about the rise of Skywalker, despite my better knowledge and because I hadn't watched Vinland Saga yet, I somehow found myself declaring after episode 7 of Babylon that it was going to be anime of the season. Needless to say, fate is a cruel mistress. It's not that Babylon didn't have its fair share of problems prior to the break it took between episode 7 and 8, I just thought the overall arc of the show was going to return to its strong direction, and leave behind the seriously questionable moralizing and philosophy writing. But perhaps if I had done my research into the staff, I wouldn't have had lofty expectations. Because the same problems happened on Mado Nozaki's last TV project, Kado, The Right Answer. Literally the same thing, a genre shift and scale change that happened at the worst possible moment, throwing away what had made these stories so interesting up until the critical finale. So let's chat about what made these stories have the potential they did, why my hopes got up in the first place, and what unfortunately went so horribly wrong. Today, we look at the collapse of Babylon and Kato. Kato's premise is right up my alley. Science fiction first contact where the resulting interaction asks massive questions about society, technology, morality. It's basically an all-in-one socio-political meatball of philosophical questions. I dig stuff like that because fiction is the perfect vehicle to explore it in. How would religious organizations respond to a godlike figure suddenly appearing? What is the international response to one country being the only one with access to an alien being? Would everyday life continue, or would productivity dive due to concerns about annihilation or rapture? These are all fascinating questions that are directly related to the topics brought up in the show, and on their own could have served as the basis for an entire storyline. Kato never goes there, but there's such a bevy of topics that it was inevitable that a 13-episode TV run would have to pick and choose. And where we start our storyline, it's certainly no slouch. Kato's introduction revolves around the first contact between Japan and Zashunina, an alien being who's from a higher dimension of reality called the Anisotropic. Zashunina introduces new technologies to mankind that have massive impacts on the world's political structure, individual life, and a whole bunch more. Shindo, our main character, is a negotiator for the Japanese government. While he's definitely too perfect, and episode zero where he helps to develop a new kind of metal treatment after researching the subject for maybe all of two nights is just the tip of that iceberg, his role as accidental abductee turned representative for the anisotropic is perfect for the early story. His early relationship with Zashunina presents tons of quandaries from how do they communicate, determining his intentions, and making clear humanity's desires in response. By the time Zashunina starts to roll out his plan to help humanity progress with infinite energy in the form of WOM, the wheels are really grooving with international politics responding to the threat that this poses to energy production, domestic politics of trying to rescue the trapped humans from the cube called Kato, who may or may not be hostages, the military concerns of tech like Kato compared to their weapons that can't even touch it. And that's not even getting into the interpersonal aspects of whether we can understand Zashunina through a human lens slash standard emotional interpretations, and the relationships that he builds with Shindo, and that Shindo has with the rest of the secondary cast. It all feels plausible, which is probably borne out best by my favorite sequence in the series as they move Kado across a city. With all of the city council arguing, transport logistics, news media interest, and the great theme that plays in the background. Seriously, this is a beautiful sequence, from the cinematography highlighting the absurd scale of the cube, the sound design of it hitting the ground, and the brilliant score. Unfortunately, it's at this point that the show begins to lose its footing. The next invention introduced has the effect of eliminating the need for sleep, which doesn't get the same socio-political interrogation that the WOM did, 
which is a shame because there are tons of economic questions about some people never needing to sleep versus others who do, how that impacts productivity and workforces, social centers creating new forms of classes of people. But instead, the show briefly touches on the concerns of the unknown health risks and uses that time to set up a date between Shindo and Sarika who suggests that these leaps of progress take away humanity's ability to progress on its own terms and sees that as a bad thing. Which is fine, and a really interesting point that I would have loved for the show to explore. Instead, Kado chooses the wrong answer and goes in the literal worst possible direction. So after a show that was making its bread and butter with concepts of how first contact could change human society and alluding to some philosophical and moral questions about the value of progress, Zashunina reveals that everything he's done is so that he can bring humanity to the anisotropic, even if, in the process, it will kill most of them. Of course, Shindo rejects such an idea and Zashunina proceeds to attack him with the intent to kill him. One plot twist, and the rest of the story is now about stopping Zashunina from forcing humanity into the anisotropic. Here's the problem. That's a massive scale change in terms of conflict. It went from a philosophical conflict, is it good for humanity to advance thanks to outside forces, are these changes good for humanity, is progress necessarily a good thing even, to the most basic, we have to stop the dude that's going to kill almost everyone, leaving the nuance of those earlier points brushed over. The new circumstances are a simple conflict, and also one that doesn't take much consideration. Killing people is wrong, moving people without their consent is wrong, so there's not a real argument for what Zashunina is planning, especially because it's revealed that he's doing it for selfish purposes. This isn't about humanity at all, it's about his own desire to consume as much information as possible. This shift in conflict also removes the agency of Shindo as a negotiator. His whole skill set is about producing outcomes that are satisfying to everyone involved. That's what he's done all along in becoming close with Zashunina and helping to introduce these anisotropic tools. And now he's just another dude set to punch and outsmart the evil guy. There's no middle ground here or an alternative solution that will make all parties happy. There is either humanity entering the anisotropic or staying in their world, and only one of those plans allows all of humanity to live. And that is borne out by the conclusion of the show. The outsmarting plan is a total deus ex machina in Shindo and Sarika's kid, who's a mix of human and anisotropic, and who completely wrecks Zashunina to prove, thematically, that even the anisotropic is still advancing. Yukika explicitly stating a thematic point that was so much more interesting when it was being shown through Zashunina reading and becoming more human is just way too on the nose, and coming out of nowhere to save the day makes me wonder why Shindo had to die. Since his trump card was sitting on the bench, though honestly the whole battle to save the world trope was never going to end well. It just got even worse that humanity had to produce a god to save itself. Like, humans' ingenuity, the very thing that Sarika argued was why they didn't need the anisotropic, was still pointless. To me, Kato was at its best when it was presenting situations that asked socio-political questions, and this action finale is not one of those, in fact, it's literally the opposite. And even its quick philosophical element, being told that Zashunina is still on his way to somewhere, just like all of humanity, while a thematically consistent belief with the earlier parts of the show, feels somewhat hollow, since it's coming from an even higher being instead of coming full circle with Shindo telling him what the right answer is. The other problem I have with this finale is that maintaining these thematic conclusions is doable without a combat ending. Just make it so that nobody dies when going to the anisotropic. Then you have a moral question of whether forcibly relocating people for the sake of humanity's advancement is appropriate. Shindo gets to negotiate with Zashunina, who is convinced he's doing the right thing, because he wants to share the world beyond our universe, with humanity. We still have the thematic point of everyone going somewhere and Zashunina continuing to change, and it makes a mental argument about communicating ideas, one of the core ideas of the show, mind you, instead of, I'm going to fight you because you are so clearly evil. While the scaling issue is still pretty small because we're no longer dealing with world governments or massive media corporations, that's easily expandable by starting a global debate about the merits of moving into the anisotropic, which could even include a worldwide vote, with Zashunina and Shindo making their cases as streamed online. That being said, if you read the ending of Kato as a discussion on colonialism, there is no issue with a combat ending, especially with the lives of the majority of humanity potentially being lost in the transfer as the stakes. In fact, it's all too fitting. 
That reading is not a cure-all for all of the problems that Kato's conclusion has, though. Yukika is still out of left field, it doesn't suddenly forgive the scale shift or the discarding of questions about the value of progress to hyper-focus on the morality of relocation and ending a life. Saruka's whole backstory really doesn't work in that ending. But I felt it was worth pointing out because it's a reasonable interpretation of the ending, and certainly a facet of the larger discussion of progress. It's still far from perfectly executed regardless, but at the very least it speaks to and recontextualizes the themes of the opening half. Maybe I'll talk more about this pet theory of mine another time, since it is a genuinely interesting lens to look at the show through. Regardless, Kato suffers from a rushed final arc that dismisses any moral ambiguity around the value of progress, a perfect main character with an all-too-avoidable death wish, a laughable deus ex machina, and way, way too much telling and not enough showing, but at the very least the ending still builds on a thematic question related to its opening in a meaningful way. That is something that I cannot say for the ending of Babylon. Cards on the table. I love thrillers. I especially love it when those thrillers are based around political conspiracies, and through three episodes, that's what Babylon was to a T. It might be hard to remember that because of the absurd direction the series takes after its third episode, but the beginning started with Seizaki investigating a pharmaceutical company who had lied about their new drugs test results, and that slowly becoming linked to a conspiratorial plot in the Shiniki mayoral election as the bodies started piling up. The slow knot untangling, the death of Fumio suggesting a dark conspiracy regarding the election, the reveal of the prosecutor's office being in on the rigging, the purpose of the city's existence to be without larger regulations, Magase, a woman who had the power to shapeshift and make people commit suicide, who was at the center of all of these occurrences. To me, it felt like it had the potential to go in a Michael Crichton-esque direction. The new suicide law that in combination with the suicide drug would enable some insane conspiracy cover-ups, and it'd be up to Seizaki and his journalist friend to uncover how the pork barreling used to elect Itsuki was being used to fund inhuman drug testing, as it would turn out that Magase was one of the results of this drug testing, which developed her power set. Now, to be clear, I'm not disappointed that it didn't turn out that way, so long as the remaining episodes made good on the tons of potential that kept the conspiracy thriller at the forefront, specifically building out the core conflict that was Seizaki versus Magase, as was highlighted as our moral and thematic focus in the second episode. That is not what happened, and I should have seen it coming. The warning sign in red lights was when it was revealed that the F on the piece of paper that launched the whole investigation was for female, referring to Magase, a revelation so pointless that it feels like it would have been better off never being clarified. But the real cracks in the armor start showing up almost immediately from that point, because at this moment, the story starts focusing on the newly introduced suicide law. Since in episode 4, while trying to take down Itsuki for the suicide of everyone who jumped in episode 3, it quickly becomes apparent they don't have a case, leaving us focused on the law itself. For the rest of the show, the suicide law becomes the central tenet by which the story is structured and organized. The overarching plot from episode 4 onwards is based around it, which means that Seizaki and Magase's conflict is overshadowed by it. And it's a shift from conspiracy thriller to pseudo-political drama, which demands a scale change. But here's the core problem with that. The show doesn't do anything interesting with the suicide law. For starters, it's poorly defined. It's clear that it's a step beyond physician-assisted suicide, and so I'm under the impression that it allows for state-sponsored suicide via the drug introduced in episode 1, but that's never made clear by the series, and we never see anyone commit suicide by said drug. I didn't even remember the name of the drug until I looked it up for this video. That's how irrelevant it is. Babylon is not a slow-paced character drama. No character in the story that we interact with for an extended period of time chooses to commit suicide as a result of the law passing. No one even considers it. And the one brief character who does choose to commit suicide that we see not as a result of Magase's power only reinforces the idea for Seizaki that suicide is wrong. In fact, the law is completely irrelevant to Seizaki's character and his conflict with Magase, with the sole exception of her power set also featuring suicide and the fact that they live in a world with it. The show never explores the impacts of the suicide law, and it just becomes a vehicle for the show to discuss morality. That becomes clear in Episode 6's debate, which, man, it's just not good. The anti-law side's argument is unprepared and incredibly poorly thought out, which 
hey, is consistent with the story because of how overconfident they were, but Babylon should also be convincing the audience that the suicide law is going to bring up some interesting ideas. The idea that an experienced politician wouldn't do a background check into his trump card is absurd, which makes the plot twist so dumb. And Itsuki's arguments for the suicide law basically boil down to, we already can't charge people who commit suicide, might as well talk about it in the open forum, which is basically just saying, we want to talk about what's right and wrong, just not at this moment, that's for later. There's no real discussion about what the suicide law would change or the larger societal impacts, it's all just as ephemeral as what the law actually says. This effectively means that anything that would ask the question of what is good and evil would have sufficed as the core tenet of the plot. But presumably this was chosen because the audience is supposed to be horrified by the mere idea of the law, without realizing that Seizaki and Magase's conflict is also a discussion of what is good and evil. Which conveniently brings us to episode 7, which to me is proof that this show still could have gotten on the right track, because this is a return to the thriller aspect of the show. The team slowly disappearing and the tension building, Kujin struggling to convey the threat of Magase to Seizaki. The ending sequence where Seizaki breaks down, it's all a bit on the nose regarding the visual direction. White blood splatter, wonder what that could be. But damn, the sound design is great and it's the focus that the show is best at. Magase versus Seizaki and his drive to take down her as the epitome of evil, opposite his own eponymous justice. This is what the show should have been, and despite the previous episode's detour, we could have come back to a gritty Seizaki, on his own, trying to find Magase in a city where her actions would have even more legal protection than ever before as he foregoes his position and is now working outside the law. We don't need the political debates because Magase states in plain terms that she is evil and he is good while dismembering Sekiro in episode 7. That's your setup for an exploration of ethics right there! Instead, that conflict is completely backburnered, and the show goes full freight on the suicide law. Introducing the President of the United States as a deuteragonist whose whole existence within the plot is to weigh whether the suicide law is good or bad. Seizaki and Magase never interact again until the very end of the series, and despite the suicide law going global, there's still no discussion of how this affects society. Part of the story even takes place in Hartford, Connecticut, the insurance capital of the world where health and life insurance multinational companies would probably be very interested in the economic outcomes of such a law. We never discuss that, but the president threatens to send the National Guard there in lieu of a legal challenge via the Justice Department or just leaving it to the governor to tackle. The show hems and haws for four episodes about basic ethics, occasionally cutting to Seizaki working with the FBI and getting a gun, but Really, it's just treading water. At least until the G7 summit, which, yeah, just like episode 6's debate, is not an interesting philosophical discussion. But it was never going to be. We as a species have been arguing good and evil for millennia. Characters explicitly discussing it in broad terms wasn't going to get us any closer to the truth because there's so much minutia to consider. It's heavy browbeating over really basic ethics discussions which is like the opposite of a story akin to No Country for Old Men, which does a much better job of showing varying levels of morality in the actions and decisions and thoughts of the characters. It allows the audience to intuit the themes of the work, as opposed to watching characters talk about the trolley problem. For Babylon to conclude after an episode and a half of debate that the answer to good was continuing was never going to be a satisfying answer. But it's especially regrettable here since the suicide law and this discussion at large was the cornerstone of the work after it left the thriller behind. The expansion in scope from a one-to-one -one conflict in the backdrop of an election to a global phenomenon with world leaders debating basic ethics is not inherently a bad thing. The problem is, again, that the suicide law only serves as a vehicle for the moralizing and that moralizing is so boring. Which I guess brings me to the final moments, Magase and the post credit scene. I'm not going to nitpick the logical inconsistencies in the finale, though they are numerous and Magase either gets really lucky or is literally omniscient. I'm also going to say that I don't think I'd have made this video without the post credit scene. I think with an inconclusive ending, I'd have likely just said, bummer that it didn't end well, recognize that it was mostly the shift in the genre, and move on with my life. 
The final moments are the return to the thriller. Seizaki having to kill the president in order to prevent the world from watching him commit suicide is one of the benefits of scale change. And then, facing off against Magase is surprisingly intense. If the show ended with Magase pulling a spike and then the gunshot over Black, you could draw your thematic interpretations from the conclusion of what is good and what is evil, make the case that Seizaki shot her or he killed himself, and that would kind of match the thematic question of whether good and justice would actually win out in the end, or if killing her would even be a real win for good, aka the paradox of evil. But the post credit scene throws all of that in the audience's face, because Magase wins in the end. Magase had the potential of being a good villain, sure I want to know what her power set was, but I'm willing to accept that she's just the incarnation of evil. She's like a force of nature, trying to awaken good people to what evil is, but if evil is really ending life, then what is the case of Seizaki's death really mean? He's not good by the metric of the show because he killed the president, but he's not evil either because he wouldn't end her. His thematic arc just ends with no answer. No one learned anything, Magase continues on completely unchanged from the beginning of the show, and her motivation still simply being do evil for no reason that the audience can hope to discern. But the nail in the coffin is, despite the president dying to try and preserve as much life as possible, so no one would interpret his suicide as a conclusion that he had deemed suicide good, evil wins in the end. Because good does not desire to cut short life, and evil will always do so, evil will win. That's the thematic conclusion at the end of Babylon. It's a damning indictment of humanity, except that Magase isn't human. Nothing about her seems to be human. She has superpowers that are never properly explained. Her backstory is shrouded in mystery. She is, for all intents and purposes, the mythical character straight from the Bible. And yet, humanity is doomed? I personally reject this. If you can accept that a character who is treated like an unknowable whirlwind of evil suddenly comes to represent the worst of humanity, then good on you, I'm just not on board. It's not even that the show concludes morality as a complex web or that amoral behavior is the normal, it's that humanity will inherently trend towards evil because evil people will kill all the good ones. But without a rational explanation or a reason to do so. Some people are just born evil, and evil is simply evil because it has always been evil. It's circular logic. Magase has no background to her motivation because she's not really a character so much as an antagonistic force. If she lost, or even if there was an inconclusive ending, I think this is passable because then it's not a clear cut, evil wins because it's evil and that's all. This post credit scene is thematically bankrupt because it never put in the effort to make a Magase win have any meaning beyond its face and the pure shock value. The show also comes down pretty hard on the suicide is evil in any circumstance point because of its conclusion about good being continuing, which seems like a pretty limited viewpoint given the subject material, but since Babylon never talked about physician-assisted suicide and the moral arguments on both sides even once, I can't say I'm shocked. All in all, Babylon's problems are far more numerous than just the ones I spoke to here. Going from a fictional city-state to real global politics was always going to be a messy transition. Acting like it's rewriting ethics textbooks with its visuals in episode 11 was another one. And again, just ditching the thriller for a pseudo-political drama. I'd imagine most people who finished Babylon with a positive impression really appreciated the well-executed aspects of the thriller, how tense it was, how exciting the conclusion was, all the while ignoring the discussion of the suicide law. But for me, I can't forgive the show for the bait and switch, especially when the initial serving was so good and the latter was just so not, especially how much came afterwards. Funnily enough, Babylon and Kato suffered from opposite problems. Kato would have benefited from keeping its discussions global and not downsizing the core conflict, whereas Babylon was at its best when the conflict was between the two emissaries instead of a political discussion of good and evil more generally. But I think the root that these decisions come from is actually in a good place, an accessible work that tells the audience what the takeaways should be explicitly. It's just that I personally believe that to be a misplaced desire. Themes of a work are much more powerful when the audience is able to intuit them, like experiencing them through the characters changing. Zashunina becoming more human while reading fiction being a great example of that show's theme that we're all progressing together. Or Babylon's almost inconclusive ending, where the audience has to grapple with questions like the paradox of evil and whether good really means that you can never end an evil life. 
To be clear, I can't speak to the adaptation process in Babylon. I have no idea what's in the original, nor do I want to claim that this is all Mato Nozaki's fault and that he doesn't know how to write. I'm merely speaking to the anime works as we received them, and frankly, I'd be more inclined to question his editors than the man himself. In my opinion, both of these stories start off strong. They are engaging concepts and premises that I think had so much potential. I'm just disappointed that, for me, they went down the less interesting paths. Also, I know I didn't do a whole here's how I'd fix Babylon section, but that'd be a whole video in and of itself, which, well, maybe, somewhere down the line. Thanks for watching.